going to finish up our passionate series today, and we're going to talk about passionate prayer, passionate prayer, okay? And before you sign off on me and say, well, forget it because I'm really horrible at prayer and, and it's something that I struggle with, I am going to quote the Apostle Paul and just tell you this. Me, Mike McKelvey, I do not consider myself to have arrived in this area, okay? I am not preaching to you today because I am the best prayer warrior that has ever lived. But this one thing I do, forget what's behind and I press towards the mark. I do desire to be better at prayer. Prayer happens to be a struggle for me. Is that okay? Can I say that to you without you all judging me? Well, you're a pastor, you should pray all day long. What would that look like? What would that look like? Okay, I mean, I don't know what people expect sometimes, but I have a hard time praying longer than 10 minutes, okay? Five minutes is probably where I max out at one setting because I have a little ADD. And no matter how uh, perfect and precise my prayer list is, I'm always distracted, okay? So as we begin, I'm just gonna give you a tool, a way that I pray uh, because I am very distracted in my thinking. I have three notebooks open when I pray. The first notebook is my list that I'm praying about. So on that will be my family, will be my church, church members, the government, uh, elected officials, things like that. And I, I keep that list very clean. I don't add a whole lot to it. Uh, if there's something major that's happening in the church, I might add something to it, but it's pretty clean cut. I stick to that prayer list, okay? But as I pray, like most of you, I would presume, my mind goes all sorts of wonky ways, okay? I'm praying and all of a sudden, I've got to remember to get the oil change done on the car this week, okay? Now, historically, I would say, get behind me, Satan. I'm trying to pray here. And I've learned that that's a mute point, that a lot of times in prayer, it's because I've been able to get my mind out of the way that I remember what I need to do. So, oil change, goes in the middle notebook, okay? As I'm praying, maybe I feel God say something to me. Maybe it's a warning or something that I feel God wants me to do. I put that in the third notebook, all the way to the right. And so when I'm done praying, what I have is what I believe God said, my to-do list for the day, and then my completed prayer list, okay? And that takes off a lot of condemnation. That takes off a whole lot, like, I was just so busy fighting the devil, distracting my thoughts, and a lot of it just ends up being my to-do list. So let me be productive in my prayer time, okay? Maybe that helps somebody. Uh, but um, I struggle with prayer because to tell you the truth, I don't, actually, I don't actually small talk very well. I don't talk on the phone. Uh, even if I get on the phone with somebody, I rush them off the phone. All right, you, you know somebody like, okay, uh-huh, yep, 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 okay, uh-huh, yep. I'm horrible on the phone. I will text you all day, but I'm really bad at talking on the phone. I'm really bad at small talk. In fact, like networking and being out socializing and trying to, like, it's hard for me. I like a deep conversation every now and then, you know, really thoughtful. And so it's like, what does prayer look like? I, I run out of stuff to say to God. And, and, I, and I wanna be better at prayer. I want prayer to mean something. I don't wanna get into some ritualistic prayer, okay? So maybe prayer is easier for you than it is for me. But then the Bible throws a scripture at us that we have to really look at. In James 5, 16, it says this. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, if you're like me, we have no idea what that just said. So a modern translation says this, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And I love this translation. Here's another one, ready? The effective and passionate prayer of a righteous person, of the righteous, works. Now that sounds amazing. But for some of us in here today, we are like, okay, well then I'm out because I would not categorize my prayer as 
ef effective, passionate, or working. Huh? Come on, we got to talk about this at church, man. Put this up on the screen. More Christians would not honestly describe their personal prayer life as being powerful or effective, and even fewer might say that they feel it works. So the question is, is James wrong or are we missing something? If I was today to ask you, hey man, describe your prayer life, would you say, it's passionate? Probably not. Would you say, it's highly effective? Every single time I've prayed, it's always worked. No, I, I would say not. I, I, I'd say that there's a little discrepancy. We'd have to figure out what is going on here because myself, I have laid hands on the sick and they died. Yet the Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now we got a situation. We got a situation. Is James wrong? Is the Bible wrong? Or is there something wrong with the formula to prayer? Woo! All right, all right, all right. I know. Say this with me. The effective and passionate prayer of the righteous works. Okay, you got to believe that. You have to believe that the prayers of the righteous works, that it works. We've got to believe that prayer works. And, and this passage of scripture is on the tail end. James says, if there's any sick among you, if there's anybody who's struggling with anything, come together, pray for one another. He even goes on to say, confess your sins to one another. Watch that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man works. That's, that's what he's talking about here. So he says, if there's any sick, confess your sins to each other that you may be healed. Now, are we talking about physical healing here? Could be. Are we talking about emotional and spiritual healing? Could be. I want to pause here for a second and tell you what kind of church you've walked into today. We believe, Family Church believes, that healing is for today. That divine physical healing is for today. I know that there's a lot of churches that believe that healing passed away with the apostles. There is a verse in the Bible that says, where there's healing, it shall cease. Where they're speaking in tongues, it shall cease. And so a lot of people say, well, yes, it passed away with the apostles. So let's just simply ask the question, which one? <laughs> which one was the last one to do it? Huh? Because the, the word apostle simply means one who goes and starts churches. Pastor Joe McKelvey is the apostle of this house. He apostled this church. He left Pennsville, New Jersey, planted a church in upstate New York. He is an apostle. He's still alive. It didn't pass away with him. So what does the scripture mean? Dude, let's just, can we just think logically for a second? Where there's healing, it will cease. Where there's speaking in tongues, it will cease. Yeah, when you die and go to heaven. You don't need healing in heaven. You don't need to speak in a heavenly language in heaven. You in heaven. So it will cease. I, I, you know why? We've accepted the fact that it passed away while here on earth. Because we ain't doing nothing with it. Because we're not doing nothing with it. Because we haven't figured out the formula to get it to work. So Paul, uh, James does qualify what he's saying. He's saying, if you want effective, passionate prayer, are you ready? He qualifies it by saying this. The qualification for a passionate, effective prayer is to live a righteous life. To live a righteous life. And for some of you in here today, you were like, oh, I'm disqualified. I don't live a righteous life. And I think that you don't understand the definition of righteous. The definition of righteous. The definition of a righteous life. 
A righteous life is not your ability to behave. The Bible says your righteousness, your righteousness is as a filthy rags. Your ability to behave, your ability to live by the law given by Moses is null and void. You cannot live that way. But the good news today is this. You're not bound by your righteousness. You are given his righteousness. If you are a Christian today, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, the Bible says this, that he, God, has made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is not a condition, it is your position. Positionally, you are righteous. Here's the, here, here's the issue. You'd say, see, my, my, my prayer doesn't work because I'm not righteous. No. Your prayer is not working because you don't believe you're righteous. Your sin consciousness, your behavior consciousness is making you feel guilty and stealing your confidence to go to God. Let me give you an example. When I was a kid, I was playing outside with a Frisbee. I threw the Frisbee and it went on the roof of the house. I'm about eight years old, 10 years old. I've got no power to get that Frisbee off the roof. I can't go get a ladder. I can't get up there. So I'm like, I'm like MacGyver. Anybody remember MacGyver? <laughs> Love that show. I'm like MacGyver. I'm going to figure out a way to get this Frisbee off the roof. So I go get my slingshot. Okay? We lived in a cul-de-sac that had gravel uh, road. It was in Scottstown. It was gravel road. So I had plenty of ammunition. And I get my slingshot out, pocket full of stones. I'm like David. You know what I'm saying? I'm like David in the Bible. He could throw just one stone, kill the giant. I'm going to knock this Frisbee off. Right? So I got it. Bow, one, two, three. I'm like 10 shots into this. They're ricocheting off the roof and all that kind of stuff. I am not even coming close to knocking my Frisbee off. And then it happens. A four foot by four foot picture window in the front of the house. Rock right through the middle, shatters the glass. What do I do? Run! Run, run! I throw the, I throw the slingshot. I'm running around the back of the house. My dad comes out because he thinks someone just shot out the house. Like it's a drive-by, right? He's like, what's going on? And I'm like running, I'm hiding, you know. Hiding from my dad, shattered the window. I had no confidence to go ask him for 10 bucks. I had no confidence to come walking around the house. Yo, dad, so great to see you. What's up? Because I know I sinned against the house, right? Let's just say, let's just call it sin, right? I committed a crime. I broke the window. I know what I did. Therefore, I was running from the only one who could fix the situation. And we do the same thing with God. We sin, we mess up, and we want to hide it. We want to delete the history off the internet. <laughs> running from God instead of running to the only one who can solve the situation. That, that's the struggle that we're having is that somewhere along the line, the enemy has gotten into our minds that our position has changed every time we make a mistake. Let me tell you, I have not been the best son, okay? I, I gave my parents a run for their money raising me. <laughs> there have been times that my parents didn't like me. Come on, they had to love me to get to heaven. <laughs> but they didn't even like me, didn't even want to see me. Get, boy, you, yo, when I get in big trouble, it's boy. I lose all sorts of names. Boy, you better get out of my face right now. I don't even want to see you. 
I want to see you, right? There's been times, there's been things that I've done that my parents didn't even like me. But there's never been, there's never can be a thing that I could ever do to change the fact that my position is the son of Joe and Lynn McKelvey. Nothing can change that. Not even death itself. Death itself can't change the fact that I am Joe and Lynn McKelvey's son. That's my position. Your position in the family of God is a righteous son and daughter. Righteous. Righteous. There's nothing you can do to change that position. Well, Pastor Mike, the Bible says, the Bible says there's only one way to hell. Listen, it's actually harder to go to hell than it is to go to heaven. Christians don't want to talk about that. Christians are so arrogant, they don't even want to believe that. There's actually only one sin that can send you to hell. And that's the rejection of Jesus Christ. The rejection of Jesus Christ. The straight blasphemy saying, God did not send his son, Jesus Christ is not Lord. That's the only way, believing that in your heart. It's actually harder than you think it is. Come on. Hey, I'm in the flow. Hey, the Bible says that if, if my people won't praise me, even the rocks and the trees will cry out. It's so easy to acknowledge him that trees can do it. Rocks can do it. Oh, my God. All right, all right, all right. But you have to understand that you are righteous. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are righteous. Woo! There's nothing you can do in and of your own strength to earn or deserve righteousness. The Bible tells us this in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? We, we, we're born guilty to sin. Watch this. But being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. It's grace. It's undeserved favor. You didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve Jesus dying on the cross. But he did it out of love for you and I. All right? So to be justified, and we say it like this. The word justified, if you've ever taught this in a Bible school, when you're forgiven, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned, all right? To be justified is to be declared righteous. You are righteous. God does not do this on the basis of merit or your ability to obey the law, but only by grace, undeserved favor. favor. It is his gift to forgive us all our sin the moment of salvation. And I love that part. At the moment of salvation. Sins are forgiven at the moment of salvation. You are not, oh my God. You are not forgiven based upon your ability to remember to ask for forgiveness. If you were, I'm just telling you this, if you were, you're gonna forget one. You're going to forget one. Because every time you doubted, every time you were outside of faith, it's a sin. It's a sin. So would you rather keep track of your mistakes or your wins? That's what grace gives us the license to do. Not to sin, but to remember his goodness. To remember that I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. Amen. Righteousness, righteousness refers to your standing in Christ, your position in Christ. All right, here's the second qualification. Ready? The prayer of the righteous is as powerful as the God to whom you pray. Okay? The prayer of the righteous is as powerful as the God to whom you pray. So, so hear me out, and, and you're not going to like this either. But prayer in and of itself, has no power. (laughs) Prayer, in and of itself, 
has no power. You're just saying words. Huh? Don't believe me? Some of the apostles or, or some, some of these guys in the Bible, they wanted to cast out some demons, the seven sons of Sceva. They said, ah, oh, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. They prayed. They ended up getting butt naked, beat up, tore up. And we ain't listening to you. Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? That's what they said. Because prayer in and of itself has no power. The power only comes when you connect it to a power-filled God. All right? <laughs> Your prayer to Buddha, nothing. Your prayer to Muhammad, nothing. Your prayer to your rosary beads, nothing. Your Hail Mary full of grace, nothing. What are you praying to Mary? Mary didn't die on the cross for you. Mary didn't die on the cross for you, right? Amen. Prayer only works when you connect it to a living, powerful God. That's when prayer works, okay? Woo, all right. When we pray, we communicate with the almighty creator of heaven who loves us and invites us to his presence. We've got to see this. Now watch. Here's, here's the trick. Here's, here's the ploy of the enemy. Here's the conspiracy. Ready? If you can feel that you don't deserve God's presence, you won't run to him. And it's only in his presence, the Bible says, that there's fullness of the joy or the fullness of the result in his presence. Every day, my son's bus drops him off at the front entrance of the church here, okay? And so I work till five, so he's, he's, his bus drops him off at 345. Every single day, he gets off the bus. And, I, and I, I normally work out in the main common work area of the offices, so I can hear my son's voice when he walks into the building. Every day, bar none, I'm in a rolly chair, so I give myself a kick away from the chair, and I roll my seat back, and I spin to the side, and that's about right when the door opens and my son is there. My son flings off his book bag, flings off his shoes, throws his jacket on the floor at work, yes, I know, and he runs and he jumps into my arms, and the chair goes sliding back. That's how Almighty God wants you to come into his presence. But do you know how most of us go to God? Um, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been about four and a half seconds since my last confessional. <laughs> Oops, I did it again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, God, if, if you would just be so gracious as to forgive me of my iniquities, saying words we don't even know. <laughs> you know, guys, I just want to come to you meekly, humbly before you. He's like, shut up. Get on my lap. Get over here. Let me hold you. Let me kiss all over you. Let me kiss all over your neck. Let me, just, let me bite your ear. I just, want to, I, just want to, I just want to hug you. I love you. If we would run into his presence in this manner, if we would come to God this way, this is what the Bible is saying. Come to him openly, Right? E.M. Bounds puts it this way. Prayer can do anything that God can do. Prayer can do anything that God can do because they're connected. They're connected, all right? When we're in prayer and we're connecting with God, all right? Now, there's a little dilemma here. How come I'm not getting my prayer to work? How come I'm not getting my prayer to work? I've tried. I've laid hands on people, they've passed away. I've, I've prayed for certain things and it didn't work. How come I can't get this to 
work. Can I get a volunteer up here real quick? Somebody strong, strong volunteer real quick. You can come up on stage. Anybody real quick? All right, Je- uh, you know, right here. Yeah, yeah, Jesse. I'm sorry, Jason. Jesse, come on up here. Come on up here, man. Got something for you. <laughs> come on, bro. Got something for you. <laughs> Is it okay? Okay, all right. Jesse, I want you to cut that piece of wood for me. I want you to cut that piece of wood for me. I can't do that. Huh? I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? So, so if, if someone said to you, uh, you, you you're going to build something, and then you bring this back in, oh, I just cut this for the project. How'd you cut it? Show me. Like, you just cut that. No, no, you said you. Say, I cut that piece of wood, right? Right. Cut it. I can't do that. All right. <laughs> Here you go, Jesse. <laughs> cut that piece of wood for me. Go ahead. I'll, I'll even let you use my stand. Go ahead. I, I really got to cut this wood. You got to cut the wood. You're dead serious. I'm dead serious. So is this effectual or fervent or passionate at all? It's availing nothing. Yes. We're getting nowhere with that, okay? Okay, so, so that's how most of us pray. And then, so you're there, you're going at it, and my little battery power chops all here. So let's ask a question. Who just cut this piece of wood? Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. No, no, no. Did I just cut this piece of wood? I did not. The saw cut this wood. We just saw Jesse had no power within himself to cut this wood. The tool does. The saw does. Even, even this saw does have the power to cut this. It's a little bit more time consuming, a little bit more skill. We can know that he's not a handyman. He had no idea how to use that. (laughs) When you pray, I can't heal anybody. I can't fix anybody. I can't answer any prayer. Listen, my job, is to give direction to the power. My job is to give direction to the saw, give direction to the power source, give direction to the one who can, the one who can heal, the one who can save, the one who can redeem, the one who can forgive. All my job is to point to Jesus. Be honest. Be honest. Can I be transparent with you for another moment? One day, it was after a service, we were doing a healing line, right? Uh, This lady comes up to me. She says, the doctors tell me I got emphysema, right? But I ain't believing it. I ain't got no emphysema. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be honest with you? I'm going to be honest anyway. As she's speaking, she smelt like seven packs of cigarettes. Huh? I got judgy. I got sinful. I'm being transparent. I judged her. I was in sin. Okay? And I said in my head, no, you probably got emphysema. (laughs) No, you probably got it. Like, you smell like it. You smell like emphysema. (laughs) I'm being judgmental. Now, if you think, if you think, honestly, if you think that there's any place for that in the church of Jesus Christ today, there isn't. I'm telling you, I was in sin. I was wrong. Okay? She comes up to me. She asks me for prayer. She's telling me her faith confession, and I'm saying, you're an idiot. That's what I'm saying. Right? I'm judging her, and I'm in sin as the pastor. So I even pray a judgmental prayer because I ain't feeling it. I ain't feeling, I don't even want to waste my time praying for her, right? So here's what I pray. Lord, as she does 
everything she can do in the natural, quit smoking. You do what she cannot do in the supernatural. Okay? Now, that seems like a really good prayer. But in my heart, it was out of judgment, like, this ain't going to work. She comes back to church next week. She's like, Pastor, I got a, a praise report. I got a praise report. I bet you do. She says, the doctors gave me a clean bill of health. No emphysema. Huh? What? And you're probably thinking the same judgmental stuff. Oh, but she probably quit. She probably quit and God did a miracle. She know she still smells like cigarettes. Still did it. Still doing it. How? Wasn't my faith. Wasn't my faith. It wasn't my faith. The Bible says this. I mean, you ain't going to like this one. Ready? The Bible says this. That Jesus sent his word and that his word will not return to him void, but will accomplish exactly what he set it forth to do. It don't matter who that word came out of. Yeah, listen, God sent his word through a donkey and it worked. God sent his word through a burning bush and it worked. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that I had no faith for that woman's healing. She did. She did. But how did it work? I don't know. It ain't my job to know. It ain't your job to know all the ins and outs of it. If we did, it wouldn't be faith. Come on, I'm just throwing this out there. I know some people right now, you're upset you don't even like that story. Because we're so judgy because we prayed for stuff that didn't work for us and it worked for this lady and she didn't do nothing but have faith. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point. She didn't think she had to clean up her life for God to visit her. And she didn't have to straighten up her house before God would come into it. She just said, God, you said that if I believe, I would receive. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you're very far from God. Like when I made that statement that you have to live the righteous life to have your prayers answered, you got real quiet inside because you don't believe you're righteous. You don't believe that you're connected to God. You don't believe that you're positionally a son or a daughter of God. And we want to offer that to you today. All right? Here at Family Church, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Right? We confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart. The confession of faith comes out of our mouth, but there has to be an inward conviction that this is real. That God loves me just as I am. Not he loves me when, he loves me now. If you believe that today, and you need to get into that relationship with God, if you need to become the righteousness of God, if you need to become a child of God, then we wanna pray that prayer with you today. And because we love you so much, we wanna pray it with you out loud. And it goes like this, dear God, dear God I, come I come to you just like I am. Like I, am. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is my Lord is my and my Savior. My Savior. Jesus, Jesus, I invite you I invite into my life into my to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! Would you give me the honor of just taking two seconds and celebrate those who prayed that for the first time? If you're here today, hold on a second. If you're here today and you prayed that for the very first time, would you just wave at me real quick? And, and we're, I see you right there, all right? Anybody else real quick in this section? Over here, yeah, I see you. Anybody else over here? Real quick, awesome, awesome, great. At the, in the back of the room, we have a little book that it's called Starting Point. There's also a salvation book on the back of the seat in front of you. We would love to give you that book and get you started on your first six days in your relationship with Jesus Christ. As soon as we're done taking communion, if you need prayer of any kind, we will have care team members at the front of the stage and in the back of the room available for prayer uh, at that time. So let's go ahead and take out our communion today. Peel back that top layer and take out that piece of bread. The Bible says this, that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are 
healed. The breaking of Jesus' body or the stripes that he took on his body brought divine healing into our lives. And I don't know if you've ever been taught this in communion before, but every time you take communion, you're remembering that you have access to healing. The Bible says that healing is the children's bread. So I pray today as we break this and remember that this is healing, that healing would flow into your body today. Father, I thank you that if there is any sick among us today, that they would receive and, and, and feel and experience the power and the presence of God touching their living bodies. So we speak to any sickness and disease that may have tried to attach itself to us, that it must flee in the name of Jesus. Those who may be experiencing pain in their body, we speak to that pain and we command it to leave their body right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for uh, the sacrifice you made for us and bringing healing to us in Jesus' name. The Bible says that after they had eaten the bread, Jesus passed the cup and he said, this is my blood that has been shed for you for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness of sin. He says, every time you do this, remember, remember, you know what he's saying? Remember that you're righteous. Remember your position. Remember that you are loved. Remember that you are accepted. This right here, remembering this is what gives me the confidence to run into daddy's house or his job and drop my book bag, drop my cares, drop my burdens, drop my baggage and jump into daddy's lap. Father, we thank you for giving us access to you, for giving us direct access to the kingdom, to the Father's house. We stand before you righteous, not because of our ability to behave, but because of Jesus' ability to obey, to obey the death, even the death of the cross. So we thank you for that. We remember that we are made righteous in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, that the Holy Spirit would rise up on the inside of us, quicken us, be with us in Jesus' name.